least yesterday we spoke about Elohim. So Rashi had cited the Midrash that originally God's intention was to create the world with the attribute of justice. So we spoke about, even though that concept we're only, we're used to hearing it only in terms of evaluation of record, but the attribute of justice is exactness. That's what it means. The world was created with an exactness that since the objective of the world is the setting for all the challenges of the Torah, and the Torah itself is Tamima, it's perfect and exact, as we said, emes kene of al kor. Therefore, the world has to reflect that exactness. So if the yardstick and the criteria which has to be met is exactness, so how do you evaluate man's behavior? All has to be done with exactness. But I just want to point out something interesting. I asked the question, we find on the, the third day of creation, God created vegetation. And the Torah says originally, God said, let the earth give forth eights pre osipri, a fruit tree producing fruit. So the obvious question is, I mean, if it produces fruit, it's obvious it's a fruit tree. So what does it mean, eights pre osipri? And then the Torah tells us, and the tree gave forth fruit. So Rashi cites the Fazal, the Medrash, that originally, when God gave the order, let the earth give forth a fruit tree producing fruit, not only was the fruit supposed to be edible, but even the bark of the tree, and even the inedible part of the fruit was supposed to be edible. Every aspect of the fruit was supposed to be edible. And factually, the angel that was created to bring about that result didn't follow orders exactly. The earth, when it gave forth the tree, it was not a uh, eight's pre. The, tr pre. the tree itself was not a pre, was not a fruit. It only produced fruit. So I asked the question, so if the earth did not manifest itself as God wanted it to, he allowed it to manifest itself not with the exactness which God said, what should have God done? He should have, he should have, been, he should have begun all over again. If God gave the order, the earth should give forth eights pre osa pre, and it was only eights osa pre, God says, this is not what I wanted. This is not, this is not my idea of creation. But yet, God let it go. Why did God let it go? Why? So we had explained in the past that when Adam originally had sinned with Eitz Adas, and God says, all the fruit in the garden is permitted to you, except for the fruit of the tree of knowledge, because it's Tovarah. And the day you will eat, you will die. And he crosses that line. And initially he had understood it to mean he will die almost instantaneously. It meant, ultimately, it revealed itself that you will become subject to death. Meaning, now at this point, you're an eternal being. When, if you eat, you'll be subject to death. Of course, from the Gemara Navod, as you see, he originally understood it to mean within a short period after you eat that, you will die. Later, it was revealed to him, he realized it didn't mean that. Subject to death. I mean, if God said, don't eat, and he crossed that line, God should have ended it right there. It should have meant, you. you death means, it's like a take, person takes something lethal, which the body cannot process, he should die immediately. And it is lethal. We explained what's the reason why sin, when you violate the Torah, why does not compromise the person to the person to the point that he dies? So we explained because there's a concept known as midas arachmin, which is referred to as no se ovam God sustains the sin, whether it's deliberate, whether it's defiant, whether it's inadvertent. God has to sustain that because if he wouldn't sustain it, that entity which is created as a result of sin. It would attach itself to a person's soul, and the person would die. So, therefore, when he says you become subject to death, means you're going to be able to survive. Because there will be a midas arachmi. 
That is the attribute of, of, of mercy. God does not allow the result of one sin, that negative energy, to compromise the person's neshama, that the person should die. But why? What is the justification? If the world was created with justice, why is justice, a component of justice is Midas Arachmin. Now, what is the profile of existence? When a person sins, why does he sin? Does he sin as a result of his neshama? Or does he sin as a result of his physicality? A human being is a, is a composite of physical and spiritual. The reason why a person sins, it's unrelated to his soul, his neshama. It's just the physicality craves and is, is inclined to do things which are contrary to spirituality. Now, the physicality is made of what? The Torah tells us. God took earth and he formed man and then he infused into him a soul of life. And that's how he became a speaking species. He became the human being. The material, the physical material, the earth, what kind of earth was it? It was defective material. The material other was created with was defective. Why? Because on the third day of creation, when God gave the order, let the earth give forth a fruit tree producing fruit, the earth did not follow God's order. And God should have destroyed the world at that moment. It's not all over again. The reason why he let it go, because ultimately, Adam had to have a basis that there should be a context of mercy. It's understandable. Because he was made of defective material, which is the earth, which did not exactly follow the order of God. That's why he sinned. So since there is a basis to ascribe the sin to, or attribute the sin to, therefore, Movis, the day you eat, you will die, doesn't mean instantaneous death, but rather means you should be subject to death, and which is interpreted, that's the Midas Arachmin. That's why there is Midas Arachmin. We find when Hashem destroyed Stoma and Amora, it was cosmic destruction. Why did he destroy them? Because it says, they run the chaton Hashem mode. Because they defiantly went against God. The appellation when God destroyed Sodom was that the appellation of Elohim or was the Yud of K. Seemingly, such an extreme level of destruction, it should say Elohim. But if you look over there, when God destroyed Sodom and Amora, it's Yud of K. Why is it Yud of K? I mean, seemingly, this is not this is not mercy. So Chazal tell us, what is the concept of mercy? God will give you another chance, another chance. Because he wants the human being, since there is value in continuing, because you may do more good, you may do some good or more good, therefore God gives you a chance. He doesn't destroy you. What about if there is no chance he will do any more good, but only more evil? And intensify the evil. Then even the Midas Arachmim, even the attribute of mercy, concurs with the Midas Adin, agrees with it, you gotta end it. Rachmim is only if there's a chance. There's a chance that something good may come out of this. But if there's no chance, what's the person what's the point to give you of having mercy? A man is a serial killer. You know, give him another chance. He can't help himself. But there, it's, it's, it's a condition or maybe it's a choice. But if a man has chosen to take on a position where there's no chance he's going to change, even the Midas Rachmim agrees it should, be, it should end. Therefore, when Sodom and Amor was destroyed, the appellation for Hashem was Yud Kevavke. That even the Midas Rachmim concurred, it should, be end, it should be destroyed. Over here, we have to have a context of Midas Rachmim. If Adam would be perfect and he had a level of clarity, which it's unforgivable that he crossed that line, because that was the level of clarity. We don't even know what the word clarity means because we're all tainted with the evil of the Itzadas. 
As a result of that, there's a basis. Let him go. So what was what was what was? How did God deal with it? He was driven from the Garden of Eden. He couldn't remain in in, in Gan Eden anymore. He was sent out. Now you're gonna live a life of so many years, and you'll meet your challenges. But as much as you leave, meet your challenges. There's always the Midas Arachman, which provides tshuva. There's always a mechanism that you do tshuva. And even if you don't do tshuva, God will carry you and tolerate you because maybe there'll be some good coming out of your life. So the reason why God did not destroy the world on the third day of creation is because, and he let it go, is because there had to be a basis for Midas Arachman. As much as God wants Rachman, but there has to be a basis for Rachman. The basis of Rachman is, it's understandable because. What was the basis for the because? Because Adam was made of earth that already did not follow instructions, which was defective material. Therefore, when it says the day you will eat, you will die, it doesn't mean instantaneous death, but rather it means you'll be subject to death and you will live the amount of years that you meant to live. That's the understanding. Why didn't why didn't God start over after day three when he saw the earth was defective with eights pre osapri? Why didn't he start over? Okay. Yeah, we had the boomerang concept. Gotta come back. That's exactly what, what we're explaining. Because since the objective creation was the human being, and if the human being fails where he's made of perfect material and he has absolute clarity, then it's unforgivable when you cross that line because we can't attribute that lack of clarity to anything, but you chose to go against God. But if there's any degree of lack of clarity, it may, even if it's infinitesimal lack of clarity, it attributed to that, therefore there's a basis for mercy. Therefore God doesn't end, therefore God doesn't end Adam's life. So, 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 so all humanity would have come to an end at that moment. And God didn't want that to happen. Good. That, that must mean that the third day was with intent. Not not intent, like this. Uh, and Andrew, I, should, I, no, I want to point out something. Way. Let's talk about an angel. If you look at the Rambam and the laws of the fundamentals of Torah, the way we understand an angel, an angel is a spiritual robot. It's all he is. He's programmed and he's given the order. You put the program in, in the in in the in this. This entity called angel just follows the program. That's not, the angel is not that. Rambam writes, an angel is a spiritual being, an intellectual being, and the reason why the angel follows God's order is because it has a level of clarity which is, almost, which is on the absolute level, therefore it follows God's order to the T and does not deviate from, from, the, from, from God's directive. That's why an angel follows the order exactly. A human being is also an intellectual being, but it does not have the human being does not have that level of clarity. And because of that, we have this wiggle room, so to say, due to many reasons why we cross lines, even if we know the consequence of the level of transgression. I always say, if a person be believes in the Yudgimal Ikram, the 13 tenets of Jewish belief, and you believe in Scharvonish. Reward and punishment. And you read and you learn that as the Ramban writes, that one nanosecond of Gehenum is more than all the travails of Eov, of Job, all the sufferings encapsulated in a nanosecond, a nanosecond of Gehenum is more than that, is more painful than that. So if a person understands that, how do you cross the line? Ever. How do you justify doing the wrong thing? And we say, and what's the value of a mitzvah? We read in Pirkei Ovos. There's no such, a mitzvah is so infinitely, innately valuable, God can't even reward you in this world for a mitzvah. So what should a person be doing? We should be pursuing mitzvahs and definitely not crossing those lines, which are considered transgressions. But yeah, we do. How? The answer is because there is a certain degree of insensitivity that we can internalize that reality, we don't have the clarity. As much as we believe we have clarity, you don't have the clarity. This a, a degree of what? Of vagueness. It doesn't penetrate us. I always say from Rabbi Shosh 
What's the furthest distance in existence? You say from the moon, it's from the brain to the heart. That's the furthest, as close as it is proximity-wise, it's the furthest distance. That what we understand in our cerebrally, to penetrate the heart, to internalize it into our being, that's the furthest distance. And therefore, Rabbi Shosanta writes, it's more difficult to change a negative characteristic. It's more difficult than to learn Shas in depth. It's easier to learn Shas, the Talmud in depth, and master it than change one negative characteristic, which is innate in the human being. Because that's going from the brain and, and internalizing it and in, into the heart. And that's the human being. An angel doesn't have that. So the angel who failed on day three, Hashem intentionally gave that angel not that absolute level of clarity. It was a certain degree of vagueness at, at the angel level that the angel, for whatever reason, did not follow the order as God gave the directive. And later, the earth was compromised. And the earth was punished. Because later we found when Adam sinned, what did the earth give forth? Initially, it wasn't meant to give forth weeds and brambles and briars and everything else. And that's the curse that God gave to Adam. Through the sweat of your brow, you will eat, you will eat bread. Initially, there was no such thing I mentioned yesterday as husks. The food that came out of the ground was fully edible, similar to the mud. Nothing was meant to be expelled from the body. Of course, Adam was basically a spiritual being similar to what? So the state of being of the Jews in the, in the, in the desert for 40 years, when we ingested the mud, the Jews were actually put on a, a pedestal that we were treated and we functioned like spiritual beings. We had no physical responsibilities. What we drank, what we ate, was absorbed in our inner organs. There was no, there was no waste. We had no physical responsibilities. We just had to eat the food, drink the water, and study Torah, and be within the clouds of glory, and to what to literally to bask in God's in God's radiance. That's what we did for forty years in the desert, and even there, the Jews sinned. We read many times the Jews were, and and that's why there was Midas Adin. There was there was the attribute of justice in the midbar. Of course, since the level of clarity was at that acute level, how do you justify crossing those lines? It can't be attributed. It was a lack of understanding, but still, we're still descendants of Adam. So we still have a trace of that evil, that Ra, which doesn't allow us to have that absolute clarity. Therefore, there's a Midas Arachman. Even with all the Midas I did, there's Midas Arachman. There is the attribute of mercy. So because God knew Adam, the objective of the world is man has to have challenges, man has to survive. But if there's justice, it has to be within the context of justice. And if there's no base within the context of justice to allow him to continue, God has to end the world, but God doesn't want to end the world. Therefore, day three, he allows the angel not to have that absolute clarity. And it's up and the angel fails. As a result of that, the material which man is made of is defective. Therefore, there's a basis for mercy within the context of creation. Is there any discussion as ask, ask the question, Mark? If God is perfect and only creates perfect things, then how did he open? God is perfect, and he could create a perfect world. But if he creates a perfect world, then there's no basis for existence, and there's no basis for challenge. Let's get back to fundamentals. God created a human being to be the beneficiary of what's absolute good, ultimately. So the question is, he should have created a soul. And the soul should exist in a perfect world to bask in God's glory. Why, do you have, why does the human being have to be put in a physical setting to have challenges? And only if you make the right choices do you have relevance to that absolute good of God, which is what we call the world to come. It's a basic question. And the Ramchal discusses this in a, a number of pla places. In the Derech Hashem, in the Das Funos. 
in the knowing heart. So he explains, as we mentioned yesterday, I alluded to it a little bit. God wants the human being to be the ultimate beneficiary of good. To be the ultimate beneficiary of good, just as God himself does as he wishes, but whatever he does, it's only because it's on the absolute level of good. The human being has to have that characteristic of choice that man does whatever he wants to do. That's free choice. If I do good, it's because I chose to do good. If I choose to do evil, it's my initiative that brought about the evil. I chose either to be proactive evilly or to be passive and not do what I should be doing. As a result of man having a similar assemblage of the persona of what God is, therefore we've already created an equal playing field or a commonality with God. Within that context, God says, you're going to be challenged. So you're similar. You have a semblance of who I am. So if you make the right choice and you take the, the correct initiative, then there's a basis for us to have, to us to have that ultimate relationship. That's why he gave man choice. Now, the Ramak writes in, um, in the Torah Dvor, based on the Zohar, that God is referred to as the disgraced king. He's disgraced. Melech Nelov. Why is God the disgraced king? We say every day, Why does existence exist? The existence is 5,784 years since the beginning of creation. Why does it exist from moment to moment? Is it because God created the world 5,784 years ago? No. Because every moment, God wills the creation to continue. If God should cease willing its, its, its existence for one moment, the world reverts back to pre-existence. So the only reason why it continues and it evolves, it's not evolving for, through its own because it existed. Because God continues to wills that existence every moment. This is the concept we say every morning in Birch's creation. He renews through creation every day through his goodness, the act of creation. It's ongoing. That's what it is. Within that context, we have choices and we have challenges to address where God wants this world to go. Because based on our successes or failings, God continues to tweak existence and wills it to address what's needed to ultimately achieve, achieve that perfection which God wants the world to arrive at a certain point in, in, in history. And that's the coming of Mashiach. At that time, God says, man no longer has free choice. When Mashiach comes, man will no longer have free choice. And that's what Shlomo says in Koelis. They can be days, they will no longer have value to the person because his, his, his behavior will not be based on his initiative, his choice, but rather he will exist. But good will be on an absolute clear level. Man no longer has choice. That's So why did God, why is he called Melech Nelav? What, so now, if based on that concept, if a person chooses to commit murder, God forbid, it's through an action. He has to pull a trigger. Why does the finger have the ability to pull the trigger? Or a person takes a knife, God forbid, and plunges it in someone else's heart. Why does he have that ability? Because God wills that every moment that he chooses to perpetrate that crime, he has that ability. So God is a participant in every transgression. Because if God didn't want the person to transgress, the person couldn't, couldn't transgress. So the power to be able to do anything is only willed by God. So God is a participant in every transgression, even though it may be the most extreme level of abomination, whether it's adultery. Why could a person, why does he have the ability to commit adultery? God forbid. Because he can do the act, but why could he do the act? Because will, God wills that if you choose, God forbid, to do that act, you have that ability to react, and God is a participant. He's, he's empowering you to do that act. So you basically, God is being disgraced. You're bringing God into the equation to disgrace him, and he participates with you. Because if he didn't will it, you couldn't do it. But why? You know why he does it? 
What is the, the what it determines the value of a challenge? The more difficult the challenge, the greater the value is if you took the, the appropriate initiative. If a person is 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 actually seduced to do the wrong, and despite the, the seduction, like Yosef Atzadik, with the wife of Putifar, and he did not succumb to her. Seduction. You know, that's why he's called Yosef a tzaddik. He's a tzaddik. Of course, that had challenge. But if he wouldn't have been challenged to that degree, she wouldn't have been the beautiful woman. And he would have had naturally no interest in her. He's not a Yosef a tzaddik. You know? Even the ordinary person will walk away from, from such a thing. But here, the temptation and the whole setting was so overwhelming. Despite that, Yosef said, can't do it. Because I can't sin against God. Regardless of how attractive and how seductive the whole setting is. So God allows himself to be disgraced to the nth degree to give the, the playing field the broadness that when you make the right choice, the right choice is the old, has the ultimate value. You hear this? You could go to the extreme to the negative. So when you go to the positive, the positive is, is, is exceptionally special because if the challenge wasn't that great, to do the positive doesn't have that special value. And God wants you to be the ultimate beneficiary of the positive if you should choose to do the positive. Therefore, this is the Ramak, this is Ramosha Kutaviro and Toba Devora. That's what God's called the disgraced king. He's willing to disgrace himself for the sake of the person to set the parameters of choice that the man, if he chooses that makes the right choice, he should be the ultimate beneficiary of the goodness of God. Okay. Now let's talk about evil, the context of choice. The Ramchal writes, Ramosha, Ramosha, the Ramchal, Moshe Chaim Lutzato writes, it's the Ramchal, it's an acronym for Ramchal. Evil, now, evil cannot coexist with God. If God would be fully integrated in existence, which is at the end of time, evil is only a result of vacuum. If God withdraws from, from existence, that's called vacuum. Vacuum allows evil to happen. The goodness, the world functions at that very special level if God is fully involved in existence. It's like a body. The human body, if it functions properly, the blood is is oxygenated as should be. All the organs are healthy. And, and, and every part of the body functions in the most healthy way. The body's a healthy body. What happens if it starts failing? The circulation is not right. The quality of blood's not right. The organs start what? Start atrophic. The muscles atrophy. Identically, when God withdraws Existence starts atrophying. Spiritual atrophy is called evil. It's like you put a tourniquet on a person's arm, God forbid, and you leave it too long, what happens to the that 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 limb? Eventually, it starts dying. Eventually, it becomes gangrenous. And eventually, it has to be removed, otherwise the person dies. Identically, the Nev Shechaim writes, the word Chil Hashem, the way we in interpret it is a desecration of God, of God's name. In Hebrew, the word halal. We say, when you say the, the bracha, after you do your function, your bodily functions, say God created man, chalulim, chalulim. What is chalulim? There are openings in our body which allows the body to function in a certain way that we can expel the waste from our bodies. Chalul means a vacuum. When man sins at certain levels, God withdraws from existence. That's Chil Hashem. We are the cause of God's withdrawal. We create that vacuum. When you create vacuum, what happens within that vacuum? That's evil. Because God, when he withdraws from existence, the consequence of that is evil. It's like you have light. As the light dims, you see less. And if you shut off, you take the light totally out of that location, you're in the dark. That's darkness. God being involved in existence to the degree that will determine whether evil exists or doesn't exist whatsoever. 
If it's fully integrated, there's no place for evil. So when did evil, when did it become integrated in Adam's being and all existence? When he crossed that line in the end of Beit Sadas, what did God do? He withdrew from creation. He withdrew. If you take a look at Chazal, that initially God withdrew. Originally, God's intent was to be on the terrestrial level. As a result of Adam ingesting that fruit, God withdrew and went back to, to heaven. And the earth, God, was not on the terrestrial level. It was meant to be like what happened at Sinai a few thousand years later. That was the original intent of creation, that God should be on earth. And what happened when God came to earth? What happened to Kabbalah Satora? The Jews were meant to be eternal. It's only because we chose to cross that line with the, with the, with the Chet Egel, that's where we reverted back to post-sin. But if we wouldn't have sinned with Chet Egel, when we received the Torah at Sinai, we reverted back to pre-Adam, the sin of Adam. And we meant to be, we called B'nai Kel Chai, we became eternal beings. Because since God was integrated, our being, as the original intent of creation was, there was no setting for evil any longer. But man still had choice. As a result of that, we reinstated the evil because God withdrew. And that came about with, with the luchos. The breaking of the luchos. Moshe broke the luchos. If he wouldn't have broken the luchos, the Jews would have had, had, had been annihilated. Because in that state, where we were, we, could, we, we couldn't coexist. Evil cannot coexist with God. So luchos, the luchos we showed, the first set of tablets represents God's presence being here. The moment he broke them, God withdrew. If he draw, withdraws, now you can continue. But of course, now the setting is post-Adam. It's not pre-Adam. And therefore, when Moshe broke the Luchas, what, what, what did Hashem say to, to Moshe? Hashem shibarto. Yashikoch hoshi shibarto. I give you a yashikoch that you broke those tablets. Because if you wouldn't have, I would have had to destroy the Jewish people. And start all over again. You know, as Rabban writes within his introduction, that the Torah itself, from the first letter to the last letter of Shem Hashem, every letter is part of God's name. You have names of God, 72 letter names, 45 letter names. And therefore, if you have a word, very important Ramban, let's say the word, Oso. Oso means him. Sometimes it's written in the Torah with the Vav deleted. So without the vowels, it can be read Ito. So let's say it's meant to be written in the deleted form. If you add that vav, so now there's no question. The way you read it, you read it as if you'd have the vowels there. Is that a kosher safe Torah? Or it, it invalidates the safe Torah? If you have a vav where the vav's not supposed to be, although it's read correctly, the safe Torah is possible. It's not valid. She so says, why? Because the Torah itself is shame Hashem. Every letter is part of God's name. Various names. And God only conjugated the letters that the narrative reads as God wants it to read. So the moment you add a letter or take out a letter, what are you doing? The bedrock of Torah, it's holiness of these, the names of God. So the moment you alter that or change it, and it's not written correctly, the Torah loses, the Torah loses its holiness. Because the basis for the holiness, the bedrock of the Shem Sashem, of the names of God, Okay, that's what it is. So you so you have to know how to conjugate the letters. So let's say every other, the every fifth letter, if you read it on a, a diagonal, you read it on a vertical, all these codes exactly were given over to only special people using these codes and being trained how to use these codes because they had a capacity, they were able to extract from the, Revealed Torah, the hidden Torah. And this is Ravina Ravashi, how they integrated and concealed into the revealed Torah, the hidden Torah. That's how it was preserved until the end of time. It's all contained within the Talmud Bavli. That's the Ramchal. Okay, ready for the halacha.